Okay, hey, welcome. Uh, this is uh, day 10 of summer school and we are working along here, uh, working towards that uh, second test. I thought I would uh, grab the schedule here and just keep uh, reminding you we are here on the schedule June 9th um, and uh, we are day 10 in terms of lecture and we are headed towards exam number two here which is uh, chapters uh, 7 through uh, 13. And so right now we are partway through uh, chapter 12. Um, I'd probably put us about 40% into chapter 12. And so let's pick up where we left off yesterday. And so I just left everything here on uh, the board. And so we shall uh, continue here. All right. So yesterday we uh, were leaving here in chapter 12, uh, trying to show you uh, what are the four states of, of nature. And I'll just say it again that, you know, when things are going, I'll call it slow, uh, they're hooked together. Um, of course, there's different melting points for different substances because it's a combination of how much they're hooked together and then how much they're vibrating. And so things that are hooked together strongly, um, I'll just take iron for example, then at room temperature it's a, it's a solid because the motion at room temperature is not enough to break the bonds that are holding the atoms together. So that's a solid. But if you warm it up, they jiggle more. And as they jiggle more, eventually they will break the bonds, or what I like to call a semi-break the bonds. And so these little gizmos here that I was trying to show you is they go from something that looks like this, where they're vibrating or jiggling but hooked together <clears throat> to something uh, that looks like this where they don't stick to their nearest neighbor. They're still kind of semi-stuck together and that's where the liquid comes into play and so at some point those begin to to break and it depends how strong those bonds are. So for iron you got to get to a pretty high temperature before it goes from a solid into a liquid. But for water H2O, it's, it's not that much. H2O, you know, just go from ice to a, a liquid and it does that at, at, at room temperature. Well, let me not go through all of that again. That's just kind of a, a, a recap. Uh, but I do want to uh, point out, and maybe I will clear this off the board here, <clears throat> that these last three that is the liquid, the gas, and the plasma, the atoms can all move around each other. They can flow past each other. They're not locked into place. And so those three are called fluids. And so let me begin by emphasizing that fluids do not mean liquids. And for some reason, uh, that's kind of the, the norm. A, a fluid is anything where the atoms can move around and pass each other. And so you can see that these three states are free to do that. Uh, this last one, again, it's a little premature to talk too much about it because the plasma also has electrical charges and we haven't talked about electricity yet. So uh, we will probably won't even touch too much on that. So mainly I'm going to say, look, let's look at some of the physics here between the liquid and the gases. And I would say the solids we've kind of really already done. If they keep their shape, there's not too much more to talk about them other than if you picked it up and you threw it across the room, you know, it would be our projectile motion. And so all that mechanic stuff really covered the solids of it. Sort of. I mean, not completely. It didn't do the stuff on a microscopic level, but it did the stuff on a macroscopic level. So what we're going to look at here in the rest of this chapter is a couple of neat properties about fluids. So if the molecules can flow around each other and past each other, what does that mean? And before we can talk too much about the fluid, I need to introduce you to a new quantity called density. And I would put density kind of in the category that we just did in the last chapter. and We're going to need it a lot in this chapter, so I'll just put it on the board here again, and that is pressure. See, pressure is not force, it is the force per area. And so if you're not careful, as I was warning in chapter 11, 
you can confuse force and pressure. Uh, that's why I had that long discussion about the, the pressure in my bike tires are actually more than the pressure in my car tires and yet the car weighs more. That is the air pressure in my tires, even though it's a lower air pressure, together that air pressure with the area make a bigger force than my bike. So it's kind of weird in that sense that I have more pressure in my bike but I have less force in my bike. And it's all because of that area. So I won't dwell too much on that, but I want to say basically the same thing for density. Density is the mass per volume. And so it's a measurement of how much mass do you have in a given size volume. And I want to give the same warning here about density as I did with pressure that it's really easy at first for people to kind of mentally confuse density with mass. They're not the same thing in the same way pressure is not the same thing as, as force. In fact, if you rearrange it to write it as mass, the total mass is a combination of the density and the volume. Uh, just like in the last chapter, I was saying that the total force is a combination of the pressure and the area. And that's how I got in that discussion about the, the bicycle. That, hey, take the large pressure in the bicycle, but the, the small area and the just two tires, you get a, a reasonably small force. It was about 200 pounds, and that would hold Mia and the bike up. But for the car tire, well, the area of one tire was, you know, uh, 25 square uh, inches, plus there were four of them, that made 100 square inches, so there was a lot of area, and so we got away with a lower pressure, even though it, it resulted in a greater force. And so I'm trying to say the same thing here, that it's really important here that you don't confuse density with mass. It, it would be like me asking this question. Uh, which weighs more, a ton of bricks or a ton of feathers? Hmm. Well, I'm hoping you're saying they're the same, right? They're each a ton. But see, in your mind, if you look at a bricks, maybe you're looking at a pile of bricks that is about, you know, waist high, about arms width apart, arms width depth. That is a ton of bricks. That's 2,000 pounds of bricks. But if you're thinking in your mind about a ton of feathers, a pile of feathers would be ginormous. I mean, the, the base of this mound would be about the size of this room, and it would stack up about 30 feet high, and you'd have to get a lot of feathers stacked there in order to get a ton of feathers. But you see, that's the weight. They're the same. What is different about it is their density. That is, how much mass do you have in the same volume? And that's what I want to uh, point out here. So density is how much mass per uh, volume. Let me give you some symbols. Let me come over here. Uh, this might uh, get in the way here. Let me take this down till we, till we need it. Hopefully I won't get it all tangled up there. Uh, but if I use the symbol capital D for density, and then M for mass and the capital V for volume, th those aren't new, but this would be our new quantity here today, density, mass per uh, volume. And so we could look at the density of different objects, but maybe to, to help you uh, get an idea that uh, density is, you know, not just the mass, uh, I brought these and in a face-to-face -face setting, I pass them around. I can't really do that in, in this setting. So maybe I'll pick them up and maybe you could tell by me picking them up. But I have four objects here that are about the size of a brick. Oh, which is because one of them actually is a clay uh, brick. But this one, its mass, is a lot less than this one. Now with me picking it up, you probably can't tell that. But maybe this one you can, because this one is getting a little bit heavy. Ah, but the big one here, I don't think I can pick this up with one hand. Oh, nope. <laughs> and so this one has a lot of weight to it. 
In fact, maybe the, the way I can kind of show this to you is what if I took this one and maybe I turned sideways to the camera and, you know, uh, motion and the ability to change the acceleration is related to its mass. And this is simple. But if I grab this one here, which happens to be at a lead, first of all, I can barely pick it up. Hold on, I can hold it here. I'm not even sure I can hold it out without me falling over. But if I tried to move it back and forth, it would be tough. And so I think that's probably the best I can do on, on, on video. But what I want you to get out of this is these things look the same. They're the same size. That is, they have the same volume. But they don't have the same mass per volume. They don't have the same density. And so this one here has a high density. And this one here is a low density. This one happens to be wood, by the way. This happens to be a clay brick. And this happens to be lead underneath the paper there. And so if I were to write some of these numbers down, it would look something like this. The, the first one, being uh, styrofoam, uh, has a density, excuse me, of about, and it depends what units uh, you use here, but this is about a tenth of a gram per cubic centimeter. Now, you don't have to memorize the density of styrofoam. Of course, it depends on what kind of styrofoam. But I do want you to see then the units here. And so that's the density of the styrofoam. Uh, the second one is the uh, wood. Uh, the wood's got a density roughly about a half a gram per cubic centimeter. The, the, the third one I have there, and this is usually what I do is people are passing around and they're trying to pass that bill heavy one, it's kind of fun to watch, uh, is the clay uh, brick. And that's got a density of three, pretty close to four. So I'm going to call it four grams per cubic centimeter. And that last one, the lead, is 11, oh, I'm trying to remember, 11.3, I believe grams per cubic centimeter. And so there's a huge variation between those two and hopefully that came across in the, in, the, in, the, in the video here. But like I said, this is a good set of units to measure density, but it's not the only set. In fact, it's not the, what I'll call the based set, right? We usually we do things in kilograms and cubic meters. So another set of units here that we will be working with is the kilogram per cubic meter. And so in some sense, the kilogram per cubic meter is better because as we said in the earlier chapters, if you're going to be measuring things and using things like energy, but joules, uh, or forces in newtons, which is kilograms, then kilograms has buried inside of it a kilogram. It also has a meter. It also has seconds, but there's no time up here. So I would almost say from a calculation perspective, these are better units. But kilograms and cubic meters are big, so in a laboratory setting, uh, we like the smaller units. But the truth is then any mass divided by any volume would, would work. But I do want to take a moment to say that if I had a kilogram over a cubic meter, I could write that, I mean, sorry, a gram over a cubic meter. I could write that as a gram over, and let's go back to chapter one, and I'll say it again. CM does not stand for centimeter. It's C for centa and M for meter. So I will cube uh, the centa. And remember, centa is 10 to the minus two. And so this is how I would convert to cubic meters from centimeters, and it would be 10 to the minus 6. If I then move the 10 to the minus 6 upstairs, it becomes 10 to the plus 6. 
And so I've done what I might call the first half of it, and that is to convert cubic centimeters into cubic meters. And then one more step, let me write 10 to the sixth as 10 to the third times 10 to the third because this second 10 to the third I could replace with the symbol K for kilo. And now I get what I was hoping for which is one gram per cubic centimeter is then, and I'll write this out as a thousand kilograms per cubic meter. So you'll be asked to switch back and forth between a gram per cubic centimeter and a kilogram per cubic meter. And so you can see there's a thousand of them. So over here, if I multiply this by a thousand, I would get 100. If I multiplied this by 1,000, I would get 500. If I multiplied this by 1,000, I would get 4,000. And here I would get 11,300. So those would be the units as well as the number for styrofoam wood. Depends what kind of wood. That's the wood I have. Uh, uh, I, I just got a... Uh, Yeah, I wonder what kind of wood I have in there. Hmm. Uh, I'll just say it's pine. I really don't know what kind of wood we, we, we've got in there. But uh, um, anyways, but uh, that's roughly the density of it. Uh, and then uh, this uh, clay, clay brick, so it's, it's clay. And the, uh, rock and clay are about the same there. And then, of course, uh, metals vary a lot. And this is lead. This is one of the higher density ones. That's why I grabbed that one. Anyways, but this is a good chance to do that. Now I should say one more thing before we really get into the meat of this chapter is what then is a milliliter? Because sometimes you hear volumes listed in liters. Uh, in fact, it's very common, especially when it comes to, you know, uh, drinks. Uh, I'm thinking of a soda bottle. You know, a soda bottle, you go into the store and buy one of those big soda bottles that uh, well, here's kind of a redone soda bottle, uh, but you know, this, this actually says on it, this is a two liter soda bottle and something like this is a one liter soda bottle. And so they're telling you the uh, volume and liters are often used for volume. I kind of think they're a waste of a unit because we already have cubic uh, centimeters. But since it's used uh, quite a bit, uh, maybe more in chemistry than in physics, let me at least uh, mention it here. And so if you take a box that is 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters, by 10 centimeters. Its volume then would be 10 centimeters times 10 centimeters times 10 centimeters. That comes out to be a thousand cubic centimeters. And for me, I, that's how I like to define volume in terms of cubic centimeters or cubic uh, meters. But this is also the definition of one liter. And so if you don't know that, I'm trying to explain the definition then of one liter is a little box that is 10 centimeters, so about that, that wide. So 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters. So there's my, my box. And that is the volume of one liter. Uh, if you divide both sides by a thousand, on this side of the equation, you will get a cubic centimeter. And on this side, you will get one thousandth of a liter. Well, let's use the prefix milla for that. That's what milla meant, a, a thousandth. And so this would be a milla a liter. And so in case you didn't already know this, let me point out, because we, we see this a lot. Like I said, maybe more in chemistry than in, in physics and even in biology, but a cubic centimeter is a milliliter. 
And so that means over here, this could have been written as a tenth of a gram per milliliter. A half a gram per milliliter. Four grams per milliliter. And then 11.3 grams per milliliter. So we'll come across milliliters on and off, but I got to admit, in a physics class, not often, because again, the liter is really kind of a, a repetitive uh, unit. Um, but it, it has its, its, its usefulness. Uh, we don't have to keep talking about cubic things, I guess, is really about the only usefulness of it. That's why I'm, I'm not a big fan of it. And uh, anyways, we'll, we'll be asked to go back and forth. Okay, so with that in mind, as I said a, a few moments ago, the main part of this chapter then is to really get into the properties of the fluids. So I brought out a number of fluids, mostly it's water, so I've got a bunch of stuff up here that has water, although I do have, and I'll leave this as a secret, I do have some isopropyl alcohol up here, I even have some salt water uh, up here. Uh, I also have another fluid, don't forget, is the air in this room. And so I didn't have to bring that, but, it, but it's here. And so there's a lot I can show you. But I'll, I'll start with this aquarium here. And so the aquarium just has regular water in it. But one of the things to point out, and is very important here, is that if you took a container filled with a fluid, and so I want to keep saying fluid. Now I know I have water. But it's important you realize that what I'm talking about are fluids. So even though I have water, water's just out here because it's really easy for me to get and to show you without being harmful. But this would be true for any liquid. So this could be, you know, a bucket of uh, petroleum. Uh, this could be a bucket of, you know, uh, all the different alcohols, ethanol alcohol, isopropyl alcohol, there's all kinds uh, it, could, it could be. Um, any liquid you, you, you could think of. But also, since I'm talking about a fluid, this could be any gas or any plasma. But let me just talk about water here. All right, so what might happen if I went down in the fluid, say some distance h. Now, if you've ever had a chance to go swimming and were to dive deep, uh, whether it be in a pool or a lake where it's fresh water or the ocean where it's salt water, you might have felt this pressure on your ears. Now, remember, we're talking about a fluid, so it doesn't have to be water. This would also work in the atmosphere. And so maybe you've driven up the mountains. And your ears are really sensitive to the pressure. And so when there's a change in the pressure, your ears can usually detect that. Now, as you'll see here, water is so heavy that you only have to go about six feet down before you really notice that on your ears. Whereas going up the mountain, you might have to go up 4,000 feet before you noticed it because again the, the weight of the air is not as much but what I want to convince you of here and you can kind of see this if we go back a couple of chapters if I made a rectangular column here and so the only thing I can think of is coming over here on the aquarium if I come down on this aquarium here and go like this, and I ask myself, okay, what then is the pressure? Does it change as I go deeper? And I think your experience of just diving in the water tells you, yes, there is a, a change. And so I want to convince you of that, especially if you've never gone underwater or up a mountain and felt that with your ears. We could just kind of run through the math. I would say this, if you look at the molecules that are right below this column, they're the ones that have to kind of hold it up. And so they're pushing upward. They're essentially the ones 
that are holding that column of water up. In other words, if those water molecules weren't here, then this water molecule, this whole column would collapse down and fill up that void. But they don't come crashing down. There's not a void there because these molecules are, are pushing back. And so the weight of this big column is pushing down. The molecules are pushing up. And as you remember from Newton's second law, then those two must be equal and opposite because we get a net force of we get it we get a net force of a zero when those two things push on each other. So let me calculate the weight pushing down. So the weight pushing down, I'll just call it weight. Um, it would be mg. And I'm going to take advantage over here of this idea of density. So the mass would be the density times the volume times g. And the volume then would be the area here, area, times this height. And so let me put A for area. I'll put it in my little diagram here. And then H for height. And there's my volume and then there's, that's G. And of course, what's pushing up is the, is the force from these molecules pushing back up. And going back to last chapter, I would say the force is then pressure times the area. And if those two are supposed to be equal, so the density of the fluid times the area of that little column times the height of that column times G, is supposed to equal to the pressure times the area. You can see that the area cancels off and we come up with an equation that I'm going to write with the H at the end of it and put a little box around it. But it's a mathematical equation that hopefully matches your experience with going under the water or up in the atmosphere that the pressure then changes with this height or depth. Maybe H was a, a bad word because I was going down so it's depth and I didn't want to use a D for depth because I'm using a D for for density here. And so like I said if you were then in um, the water and you dive down oh I said six feet, but let me just change that to two meters. Let's calculate the pressure when you're two meters down. Okay, so if I'm two meters down, I'll start here with the density. Now, the density would be the fluid that you're going in, and so I said water, and so I'll just give you the density of water. The density of water is a thousand kilograms per cubic meter. Uh, G is the 9.8 meters per second squared. And again, if I go two meters deep, that's my calculation. How, how, how deep am I? And so if I multiply this out, uh, let's see, should I grab my calculator or is this a uh, 9 19.6 and then multiply by a thousand. Okay, so it's 19,600, but it would also be nice to see the uh, units uh, here. Uh, again, this should be a force. Am I, oh, good. Uh, I almost didn't see it here, but there's the kilogram, there's the meter, there's the second squared, so that's the Newton. And then this meter would cancel with one of those. So that would be Newton per square meter. And so this would be the 19,600. And if, again, remember from last chapter, the unit for pressure is in Pascals. So I would say the pressure has increased from uh, the atmosphere down to the, or up to, or excuse me, increased 19,600 more. Now, let me also just remind you, I didn't show it here in my diagram, but the same thing is going on with this giant column 
that is made out of the air. So in other words, this, this little math I did was what, what is the pressure as you go down in the water? But it's the same idea as when you go down in the atmosphere. This kind of explains something that we said in the last chapter. Because in the last chapter, if you were at the top of the atmosphere up here, the pressure would be zero. And we said when you got all the way down to the surface of the earth, what we called the atmospheric pressure then was 101,300 pascals. And so now I hope it makes a little more sense where that pressure came from. We talked about in the last chapter was the hitting of the molecules and that's true. That's really what I'm saying here. This is the hitting of the molecules. But the reason the molecules have to hit so hard is because they've got to support all this weight. And so that's why the deeper you go in your fluid, the greater the, the, the pressure is. And, and that's the point I'm trying to get you across, both conceptually and mathematically. And so conceptually, I hope you see why the pressure has to get bigger as you go further down. It's got to support more weight. And mathematically, I hope you also see why the pressure has to increase. That's this little formula right here. The, the bigger the H is, the, the, the greater the, the, the pressure is. Again, that's why going up the mountains, and so if you're here and you go up the mountains, the pressure is going to decrease. And you're going to feel that in your ears. And then when you go down the mountains, the pressure is going to increase. And again, you're going to feel that in your ears. Or if you're swimming, you could go down underwater and the pressure is going to increase. And you're, you're going to feel that. You're going to go back up and the pressure is going to decrease. And you're going to, you're going to feel that. And so the, the pressure changes with depth. And that's the first and really kind of the, the beginning part of the behavior of a fluid. In fact, it's so important. I thought I would show you a couple of little experiments here where the pressure then changes with depth can be uh, fairly easily seen. And so maybe the easiest one to show you is this two liter bottle that then has three holes in it. I'll turn it towards you first. Um, and I, right now they're just plugged with uh, little nails. Um, when I open the lid so it can flow out and pull out the nails, well, watch what happens. And so I pull this out and I pull out the three nails and maybe I'll hold it up on this edge so you can see each of them. And the water comes shooting out. Uh, I want you to see, <laughs> I've already ran out of water on the top one, but the bottom one is shooting out with the greatest speed because it's under the most pressure. And then this middle one is kind of a little bit less than that one and this upper one, well, as you already see, it, it already ran out of water, but it, it, it was barely shooting out at, at all. And so this is my simple experiment of trying to show you that the uh, pressure does change uh, with uh, depth. Now, that being said, let me do a second one here. Uh, let me first kind of prime it here. Okay, well, that's pretty good. Let me leave it alone for just a second. Because I want to add to this picture. Because there's something more going on in this discussion than you might have first saw. And I put the molecules underneath pushing up. And, and although that's true, fluids, uh, maybe I should leave that there, fluids can flow. And so there's something neat that can happen with the fluid. Now, th this wouldn't work with a solid, okay? But this would definitely work with a fluid. So if I were to take this aquarium again, okay, and, and as you just saw, down here, there is a pressure, and we have calculated that that pressure, I'll just point to it, would be the density of the fluid times G times however deep we are. That's what I'm saying. The deeper you go, the, the greater the pressure. I described that in a way that had to do with gravity. That is, these molecules down here are the ones that are hitting, trying to hold it up. But because it's a fluid, 
And because the molecules can move, as they're busily hitting up here, they come down and they push this way. They hit off each other and they push that way. And so maybe I'll change colors here, but I want to convince you that if I take this little green box that is underneath that is holding this big column, this green box, the pressure is pushing in all directions. It is not just pushing up. The molecules come down and ricochet and go past each other and they go that way. Then they ricochet and they go that way. And then they ricochet and go that way. And they ricochet and go that way. And so although I derived this equation thinking about them pushing upward, that's not the only thing they do. And the good thing about that is I don't have to change my calculation to figure out what they're doing sideways or what they're doing down. I just need to realize because they are a fluid, they would behave in this, this way. And so I'm going to put a green box and say the pressure at this point is here. But I want you to say if I took a little box, then it would be pushing up and it would be pushing down and it would be pushing left and it would be pushing right. You, you see, the reason that's in, important here is in that experiment I just did, I drilled a hole in the side of it. And didn't you see it go shooting out sideways? See, I didn't talk about it going up. I used the fact that it's a fluid to point out that the pressure going sideways would be the same as the pressure going upward. So I, I calculated going upward, but I demonstrated it over here as going sideways. And the second little demonstration I want to do actually fits that same idea. It's a little different here. I, I have a container. It's, a, it's an old school IV bottle. And I'll 